All right, folks, it's time for Shiny Side Out with David Dunger and Mecky. You're listening to Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. You don't need to expect us. We're already here. Take it away, guys. Ahoy, ahoy, and welcome to Shiny Side Out with Dave Ah, and Mecky. We are coming to you live from the Freedom Slip Studios in Sydney, Australia. And we are one piece of the information super puzzle on Revolution Radio on freedomslips.com. You can talk to us in the chat room while we're on the air. And yes, we are live right now. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook uh, to get updates between shows. And you can check out ChineseHideOut.net for our show archives, show notes, and links we paste into the chat during the show. And you can also get one of the following apps for your smart device. <coughs> Revolution Radio, TalkStream Live, TuneIn.com, HTTP, and then the slashes, you know, RadioTuner.com. So you just want to put that in, RadioTuner.com. You can also purchase a Grace Tabletop Radio. Or, and this is really what we'd like you to do, you can go to www.freedomslips.com and jump into the chat right now. If you're on YouTube, please find <laughs> us on Freedom Slips and come on a Sunday afternoon or for you guys Saturday night. The number to call in if you're in the United States is 347-688-2902. The number again is 347 688 2902, or you can add us in uh, Skype. Uh, simply add Freedom Screen. Freedom Screen, one word. And thank you very much, Solaris, for a great show just preceding us. Uh, I particularly enjoyed the last uh, few minutes on the zombie meme. Uh, you know, I'd love to talk to your guest just on that. I find that fascinating. Um, Dave, how are you, mate? I'm doing pretty good. I hope I, my audio is not too hot. I've been playing with it today. No, your audio is great. I have to apologize for my voice. I have been really sick. Yeah, what's going on? I have some kind of flu pneumonia. I don't know. I'm, I blame the CIA, so <laughs> it's all good. No, I've been really sick. I've been running a... Actually, I've been hallucinating <clears throat> Tuesday, Wednesday. Uh, I, ran, I ran, I think, 42 degrees uh, fever, which is pretty high if you've never had it. Mm. And uh, yeah, I was I was uh, I was hallucinating about work of all things, which is never, <laughs> ne- never a good thing. Yeah, you know, did just, you solve all the problems though? Ah, uh, not really. No. Oh. <laughs> so my my voice might sound a little scratchy, guys. So I apologize for that. Uh, and, uh, you're lucky to be alive after 42 degrees. Yeah, it was it was it was it was hot. It was uh, yeah. I felt I was sweating and all kinds of things. But uh, we used the old trick: you wrap your legs into ice cubes. That's an, an excellent trick. Ice cubes. All right, for your legs to keep, or you can go jump in the bathtub. It will also help. You don't um, have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I do. I do want to give a shout out to Sydney though, and, uh, and a thank you uh, to Sydney Siders. Uh, last Sunday I couldn't make it. I want to apologize for that, and I think you deserve to know why I couldn't make last Sunday's show. I was in the city with my wife, and um, we walked along Market Street, uh, which is uh, right near David Jones. If you're familiar with Sydney. And my wife simply collapsed. She fainted, and uh, people rushed in from all over the sidewalk to help us, lend us their phone, give us their blankets, so my wife considered it, and she came too very quickly. Ambulance came, nonetheless. Uh, um, This was around, I think, about 1-ish in the afternoon, 1 p.m. Uh, And our show is actually uh, local time, 4 p.m., so it's three hours um, until the show. But we spent, uh, I think, five hours at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital. And thank you very much to the staff there as well. And the Ambo drivers, <clears throat> you guys were great. Thank you very much. Everything's well, just in case you're wondering. And so, I was. Yes, no, everything, everything's fine. Uh, it, it's just apparently one of one of the things we can uh, expect now that that my wife is expecting. So she had the touch of the duchesses, did she? Yeah, I guess that's true. <laughs> that reminds me of Danny Kay, uh, the touch of the duchess, <laughs> and the pot in the pit. <laughs> Hang on, that was the um, the poisons in the chalice with the, right. the vessel with the pestle. And the, <laughs> Is true. I love Danny K. Um, yes, um, but how have you been, my friend? Uh, everything well? Yeah. I, it's funny that you talked about, because I had the fever and then, you know, I got pleurisy. Mm. Good on you, whoever you were, um, out there that gave it to me. But I was reading something quite extraordinary this week, because I don't know what I've done with myself, but I've immersed myself on in news. Nothing but news because of the new World Horizon uh, show that's on and hosted by Angela with many, many, many guests. Unbelievable lineup and talent in this. And I, I've got 15 minutes 
I got a 15 minute bit where I read some news out and this week has been absolutely, I'm going to tell you, absolutely chock-a-block full of news. Um, it's been solid. Something that that jarred me this week, Mickey, I've got to tell you. Go on. Is the, the beaching of, of a lot of sea creatures. Okay. One of them, okay. one of them, or fish, you know what? Uh, fish, yeah, and I feel sorry for fish, and I feel sorry for uh, for whales and all of that, and even um, manta rays on different coastlines. Mm-hmm. But something really weird okay. was the beaching of dolphins. Okay. And you know what? They were found to have pneumonia. Are you kidding? I am not kidding. I want to know how you can get pneumonia. If all you do is breathe in once or you know once every once in a while above air, and duck about under the water again, well, in know, salt water. This is this is interesting. Uh, I mean, if if it's not a viral infection or bacterial infection, for instance, right? Mm-hmm. But but rather, uh, uh, I guess the biological response of your body uh, to hypothermia. I don't know. You know, something like that. Maybe if if your lungs <coughs> are cold, if 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 the temperature around you is not what you're used to. I mean, there's a lot to be said for this whole global warming thing. I'm not saying that the, that it's warming or cooling or whatever. I mean, the weather patterns are changing. You, you have to be a moron. I'm sorry <laughs> not, not to see that, right? I mean, I, I grew up in Europe and lived there for 20 years. Now I've lived 20-odd uh, years in Australia. And I, I've seen the weather over my lifetime change in Europe. Um, I'm not there now, but I know that in Europe nobody has – sorry, I'm talking about Central and Northern Europe – nobody has air conditioning. Because it's not necessary, and we, we never used air conditioning. 30 degrees, if it was 30 degrees by 9 a.m. in the morning, we would get a day of school, okay? Mm-hmm. Celsius, I'm talking. Now, we're talking 40 degrees and, and all kinds of crazy weather hitting Europe. Um, you've got these, these crazy uh, storms that are hitting the States, you know, blizzards, and, and you've got the, the landslides, which are co- occasioned by these, these massive rainfalls in the Himalayas and washing away entire Bangladeshi. And, and, and what about stuff. China? Have you seen oh. the, the crazy wet floods and stuff and the typhoon? Exactly. Uh, they, they've even had tornadoes Exactly. No. in China. 100% correct. And, this, and we had something like this here as well in Sydney. There was a tornado off, or like a water hose off the coast of, of Sydney, which never happened in, before. In fact, just south of Sydney, they had two tornadoes yeah. that, that broke. Yeah. Um, they call it a water spout. It's yeah. still the tornado because That's it's right. still – it's not a, t- a typical water spout that isn't sur- um, involved in by you know being created by a storm cloud. Mm. That's a typical water spout. But this one is storm cloud driven, was just basically a tornado on the water that crossed onto the land and destroyed a whole bunch of construction work. Exactly. And, and to come back to your point about the dolphins and other sea creatures, mm-hmm. but specifically the dolphins because apparently they had pneumonia, which is incredible. Yep. Well, not incredible, but it's unusual. Um, well, what, what if the water uh, is, 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 is changing its temperature? I mean, uh, what, what if, if, if different bacteria are moving into different areas? Aha! Do you know what I mean? This is going to be a segue. Are you ready for it? Uh, go ahead. In India, I've been in, I have been following this down, and it's a rabbit hole. I've been following it down. In India, it rained red rain. Is it a bacterial rain? Yep. Ah. It was originally thought to be blood vessels because they look like blood vessels. Yep, yep. It was dead set red. See, there, there, we have this uh, happen, like when people talk about the sea turning red, there's actually a bacterial fungus, or yeah. well, fungus, sorry, a bacterial infection, or, or a little creature that, that uh, multiplies incredibly fast, and, and you know, trillions and such, t- thousands of trillions of, of creatures. Now, obviously what must have happened is they must have got sucked into the air, right? No. Oh, In no. fact, no. In fact, the perfect condition, remember, you only need three things. You need an environment, you need food, mm. and you need the, the life source that's going to replicate. So you need replication. So they're thinking at the moment, and as astounding as this sounds, because five days it continued to rain red rain. Oh, wow. And for those five days and that red rain, um, the first thing that was suggested by science was that a flock of bats were flying and got hit by a meteor and it rained red blood vessels. <laughs> You're kidding me. And, and that was science. <laughs> science, to, you know, all the way there right to the end to the goalpost with that one. Um, <laughs> though it was disqualified pretty that's, early on. That's better than the weather balloon, man. You I know, they continue to run to the goalpost. Um, it's rugby week down here, and, and we lost against New Zealand. Good on you, New Zealand. Um, the thing that was really important about this was that it looks as though the 
the red algae grew in the cloud. That's interesting. Given that they'd been having some excessive heat, and uh -huh. and as it went up into the cloud, it just happened to have enough food to replicate in the right environment, and voila, when it rained, it rained red rain. We That's... know that we've had red plumes and blue-green algae plumes in our, in our rivers, and, you know, we've seen the red tide. We saw red tide, didn't we, Mecky, here in Sydney? Yes, we did. Right, so, yeah, it wasn't that it evaporated up. It maybe some of it did, but it certainly grew into a cloud and, and rained red rain. That, on its own... Imagine if you're a dolphin and you happen to breathe this stuff in. You're not going to have a good time. No, but that's that's very interesting that it would grow onto the clouds. But but to go back to the disease vector, I mean, if mm -hmm. these things are happening, and, and the thing is this, the, the more we change our environment, right, the more we, we, we hack into the jungle or change the ocean or, you know, make our modifications, the more we change the little micro environments that exist and we release... Hitherto unknown diseases, like um, I give you Ebola as one, right, uh, and others as well, though, that, that were unknown. <clears throat> but then, uh, you know, someone decided to log the entire jungle, and uh, before you know it, the monkeys and the bats and whoever was infected took it out. Now, the same thing could happen, I guess, with the dolphins. And now, if, you, if you're telling me that you can have these little creatures growing in the clouds, right, and these, these are like uh, usually monocellular they are. Little, little critters, right, like algae mm -hmm. and such. Then uh, what, what's what's to, what's I guess uh, I guess why can't diseases or viruses or or bacteria, be delivered in the same way? Yeah, or even yeah, or grow on those critters, right? Because they're even smaller yet. So mm -hmm. um, this is that's actually quite scary if you think about it. Yeah, I, I looked, I I drew down the, the ramifications of that and thought that was pretty horrendous. The the other thing that we talked about um, to do with the dolphins, another one of the excuses was that just they. He came into contact with these jellyfish or something, right? It's like mm. they, they live in the ocean. Yeah. It's more than likely they're going to come in contact with jellyfish. Yeah. And then I started going down that one, and I found that the water is is has risen by a couple of degrees where it normally wouldn't, and now this normally quiet holiday spot in summer is now teeming, teeming with jellyfish, and you can't go. They're all poisonous. So it yeah. shut down the, the tourist, you know, um, the, 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 the whole ter the whole the, it's only tourist area right yeah. the only thing that they do is supply nice places for tourists to go and they've had to shut down so we it, around around the north of australia it's even though it's beautiful you can't go in the water either for the saltwater crocodiles and all the other things that'll kill you but there's this little tiny thing it's less than um a th one thirty second of an inch across mm -hmm. and it'll render you immobile and two weeks of your limb feeling like it's on fire. This is called irukandji. Mm -hmm. And it's the smallest jellyfish with the most potent um, sting per size. It's just crazy. And that, that's, that's coming down our coastline. It was originally just up near the Philippines, but it's come down the eastern coast. And it's, it's still in Queensland, but it... Yeah. I think past Cairns or something. It hasn't made it past the Sunshine Coast. Yeah, and just to let you guys know, this is the reason why you have to wear those funny full-body suits when you go to the Barrier Reef. Yep, because uh, that's that thing, man. If it if it gets you, if it touches your skin, just touches your skin, yeah. it fires barbs out from its the, the most minute tentacle, crazy little thing, and that's it. You you feel like someone's got an oxy torch or an acetylene torch on your arm. And if the pain is so extreme that you've got to be medicated on morphine for two weeks to get over it. Yeah. Well, if you if you make it out of the water, because if the shock sets in, you will drown. So. Oh so. yeah. If it was a if it was a central <laughs> core, if it got you on your your chest or something, that would be you know pretty devastating. That's um, horrible. Outside of that, yeah, Becky. <laughs> <laughs> um, the the tragic news in in Egypt, you know, mm -hmm. where a government ordered its military. <laughs> Yeah. To shoot its own people. Yeah, this is actually a very interesting situation, you know. Um, oh, it's, what's the total? 636 now and, and oh, more than 1,000? I, mean, yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I don't like to play the numbers game with these kinds of things, but, but yeah, it's, it's a horrendous number, and it's, it's, six, it's over 600 people that have been killed. Now, mm -hmm. the funny thing in Egypt is this. This government was actually democratically elected, right? Now, you can disagree with it or not. I don't really care. Uh, you know, it's, it was the Muslim Brotherhood that was running the country, or <clears throat> I guess it was a, I guess a more Islamic-centered kind of government, but it was elected. Okay, it it wasn't like they they just took the power, right? Wasn't that the coup? And no, no, that that yeah, no, to to oust them, yes, yes, that's correct. To kick them out, so they they were elected, and then the military kicked them out. Okay, so that's what happened. So now the people are protesting, and 
and uh, the military has taken over because of well, who knows why, right? Various reasons. And now, but the protests have gone so strong though that that now people are being killed in the street. Um, well, hard hard for us to imagine, I think. Well, they, I was watching the footage of the military snipers on the building <laughs> sniping the protesters. Yeah. And that's just wrong. The only opposition, you know, what what do you do to a combatant if you're in the military? You shoot them, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You don't offer them cake. <laughs> yeah. In in Australia, what we do for a protest is we cut off their escape route and slowly push them back in a in a predetermined lane, out of away from the the target zone. And, you know, we'll disperse them, we'll encourage them to move, but not by gunfire, certainly not lethally. Yeah, that's and right. that's really tough, right? And I, if that happened in the US, if any, any, I have to say this to all the Americans, and I apologize for this, but you'll see where I'm coming from. If this was your town, and that was happening, and the, suddenly the police started shooting people that were protesting, wouldn't you turn? against the government for that, for ordering the, sh- the death of its own people, innocent people protesting, which is a normal state of affairs, right? You're allowed to do it. And I know I know everyone's bustling to call in. You know what? I know that they're limiting your rights to do stuff, and now you have to organise a protest in advance and apply to have a protest and get permission to have your protest, and you just don't want rent a crowd there ruining it for you. But this is the thing, though. I mean, the protest itself, I don't think, would have been too much of an issue because it came to standoffs and they were holding up in a mosque and there were, you know, there was violence happening. And I'm not saying violence happened, you know, for whatever reason. I, I wasn't there, so I, I can't tell you. But mm-hmm. the violence happened anyway. So the, the protest turns into a riot, into, into maybe more than uh, maybe a revolt or street battles, as it were. And then... Whoever started it is it's not really relevant, but now we're at a point, and this this can very this can happen in any city. And look at the L.A. riots, right? You look at the race riots in the '60s in the in the U.S. Uh, you look at um, and look at the uh, Indian independence riots as well. I mean, it doesn't matter where you look; the, the, these 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 things will happen. The protests will probably start out harmlessly enough, and then for whatever reason, and usually there are some uh, Asian provocateurs, you know, <laughs> people that are paid to make trouble. For for an end, because yeah, we we call them rent a crowd. Rent a crowd, right? Yeah, once because once you've got people making trouble, then you can enforce whatever mm-hmm. you want, whatever means of, of of suppression you require, you can, and that's the danger. Yeah, so you know, if it was in the U.S. and that happened, there would probably be a civil war as a, as a direct result of that news getting leaked out the way it did to us. But I, you know, I saw retaliation. Um, I've just posted a link, by the way. It's the Egypt Daily News. It is an inter- independent uh, news, or, news, or, news, sorry, news authority in, in Egypt. And you know, I don't want to really, I don't want to overstate this, but we're looking at the polarization of Egypt from this mm. because it was non-Muslims shooting Muslims, and you have to remember that. That's not a great. That's not a great place to start. If you're going to start a chess game, you don't want to be there, right? <laughs> and because you, that could be, you know, you could end up with a holy war. And we don't want to, no, no one wants to go anywhere near any of these things. Um, but, you know, just to, just to say, I'd, I've got it on record that I said that. And if it ever turns out to be, I'm going to point at that, you know, from my deathbed while we all perish and say, you know, actually, I, I, I saw that coming. And that didn't help anyone. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. It's not going to help anyone. Yeah. But look, just, just, keep, just keep your eye on it, people. You know, we interviewed Stan Dayo. He said there was going to be some war, and then suddenly th- all this violence escalates out of thin air. And, you know, it, it could be this. We don't know. It's the right area. Don't forget that Stan Dayo puts the, the last, well, not the last battle, I should say, but obviously the, the Battle of Armageddon, which is mm-hmm. Megiddo in, in Israel. <clears throat> formerly Palestine, uh, he, he puts it there, right? And mm-hmm. he, he sticks with, uh, I guess, Bible prophecy in that particular component anyway. Um, mm-hmm. It's the right area of the world. Um, they're just across, the, 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 well, they're the neighbors to, to Israel at this point. There's violence happening uh, at the moment. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, unmitigated violence, which is, which is bad. There, there's violence all around across the region, Syria, you know, we, we know what's happening in Iran. Iraq still hasn't settled. Afghanistan is still a mess. The entire 
Middle East right now is a mess. It, it's, a, it's a horrible, horrible mess. And, and I, I, I tell you, I, I studied this stuff at uni. All right? This was my master's. Oh, sorry, my major, I should say, not my mm-hmm. master's. Um, Middle Eastern politics. And uh, I look at it and I go, you, you can't fix it. It can't be fixed. It's not fixable. Um, Step away. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, but that's, that's yeah. how it is. Anyway, uh, that, that's going too far afield, I think. Um, there's one, one piece of news I, I would like to share with you guys. Yeah, bring it uh, out, man. Which, which uh, I found fascinating. Do you recall the, um, uh, the bee colonies or the hives uh, dying out? Especially yes. Especially in the States. There are millions yes. of hives, in fact, right? Mm-hmm. It's called sudden uh, hive collapse uh, or sudden colony collapse syndrome. That's right. Um, now they've, they've, they've uh, found they think the culprit. Oh. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I've I got to find the link again. Uh, I, I lost it, but I'll, I'll post it back into the show notes for today. Um, essentially, um, it, it's, it's pesticides. Right. What a surprise. <laughs> Who so, knew? So we, we think that poison is not so good for everybody. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so apparently what it does, it, it, it plays havoc. This, these particular pesticides or these particular compounds play havoc with the bee's ability to navigate uh-huh. and to communicate. So yep. it's, it's, it doesn't kill them. Right, but it, it it stops their communication and navigational uh, uh, prowess, if you will. And B, it, bees are specifically, uh, I guess, colony uh, driven, and 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 um, and they survive on communication. Totally. I mean, it's they, they they work as a collective. So if if you don't work as a collective anymore, and that's that's where your well livelihood lies, then the entire colony collapses, which is what we've seen. So. So it's the pesticides, because they found abnormal amounts of, of, of pesticides within those collapsed colonies, uh, or, or the bees of those collapsed colonies, and they tested it on other insects, and they found that it does uh, interfere with the communication and, and the navigational skills and so forth. So, uh, there you go, mystery solved. Um, let's use more pesticides. DDT is good, I hear, so, um, well, not oh, can you don't, don't start that. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to wipe out DDT because it was really bad for people and their DNA. Um, yeah, so I, I was, I've was i been looking at this, and I've also been looking at the amount of earthquakes. And, and of course, this week we had some extraordinary earthquakes around us, and, uh, you know, not even, you know, not even about a thousand kilometers from our shore, um, a, a new earth, uh, sorry, a new volcano erupted. And uh, also in New Zealand, we saw, I don't know, there's 20 or so earthquakes now uh, above six in the last five days. Uh, the, Damage is minimal, but uh, continual. And so houses that were okay, you know, a minute ago, and now, you know, you can't live in them. So um, they're structurally unsound. And this is happening at a domestic level. And one of the other things that I I wanted to bring up is, um, just from an earth changer's perspective, the amount of sinkholes... Huh, yeah. In the U.S., is that not crazy? <laughs> I love sinkholes. Huh? I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> you go well. You know, maybe it's all that mining and and you know that the fracking that you guys do or that we do in Australia as well. I have to say, oh, right? fracking's do, awesome, right? We do. Yeah, we do a lot of it. The the the, the, the <laughs> gas. By the way, I hate it. Yeah, no, it's it's the worst. Um, yeah. But but you know what? Um, if if you if you think that's a good thing, keep doing it. Sinkholes are good. You know, you just. Throw all your rubbish down there, right? That's what you do. Do you know what? When you look at the Yucatan Peninsula and you have a look at all of those, and I forgot the term for them in, uh, like the Mayan term, for those round circles that just go straight down through the limestone. They're uh-huh. perfectly round. Look like they've been drilled. Yep, yep. I, I, they call them something in particular. I, I'm, but you know, um, and they're filled with water. It looks like that was a great civilization that got ruined by sinkholes. <laughs> The U.S., sorry to start you coughing, but the U.S., in fact, it looks like it's suffering from exactly the same fate. They're opening up everywhere, and I'm... Sorry, yes, I was coughing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, it's possible, because they are, oddly enough, perfectly round. Yep. You know, that, that's, that's what I find amazing about these sinkholes, to be honest with you. Hello? Oh, yes, I'm still here. No, mm-hmm. Justin, I can't take your call on still there. Still there? Yes, I'm still here. You're still here. Hello? Hello. Uh, I think we may have dead air. No. It's just you, Mecky. Are you still there, Mecky? Hello. Yes. Well, you didn't lose me. Let's just see what Justin says. Hey, Justin. Mecky? 
Mecky, are you there, Mecky? Hello, can you hear me? Hey, yes, I can hear you. What happened? I don't know. Okay, that's odd because I was... You were talking, I muted, I coughed, I unmuted, and you were gone. Yeah, well, Justin's, Justin's here. Did, Justin, do you have something to bring to us? Uh, no, I had a comment on what you were talking about a little bit earlier, but... Oh, go on, bring it up, quick. I was just going to say real quick, we all saw that coming in Egypt, but we have to remember that the reason they have the snipers up there with their military is because they couldn't get the people to fight against each other, like they tried to do in the States with Trayvon Martin. It didn't work here either. And nice. they're getting desperate. They're running nice around. point. They're running around with chickens like their heads cut off, and it's going to be ugly. People are going to get killed. But if this is going to be done, uh, you know what? you got to stand up tall and say, give me liberty or give me death. And if you choose the second one, you're going to be hearing those Clint Eastwood words. Do you feel lucky, punk? <laughs> well, do you? Yeah, exactly. You know, that... Um yeah, so, look, sorry about all the news being a little dire, because uh, I'm looking, reading the comments in the chat room there, and you know what? This is just, it's the amount of news coming out, and these, this is only the top. This is the, the cream off the top. I mean, the, there should be a whole show on just good news. Yes, you know, nice. someone's just discovered something awesome that's going to fix the whole planet. Well, hey, put a pause on that, and let's do some... Um, analysis of what that could actually do. Remember GMO? That's going to fix the whole planet. Yeah, everybody's <laughs> going to eat something. <laughs> yeah, you know, let's have a look at let's have a look at this. Let's have a look at that. And you know, suddenly now frogs die away, then bees die away. We don't know what's happening. Mm -hmm. You know, science really needs to do its projections properly and do its its you know its research. But you know what? This this I can smell a segue coming here, and um to do with a video that I saw today, and don't hate me, everyone. You know, I, I'm i sort of obsessed and consumed with um, trying to to understand more about the nature of our planet and how fragile we are, regardless of what that happens to present to me. I, I think that the best thing that I can do is determine all of the outcomes and make my plans accordingly. Now, preppers know what I'm talking about, because I've described prepping in a sort of way. But, you know, knowing what the threats are... I mean, Mecky, what, what's it called? SWAT, right? SWAT. Yeah. So, you, you've got to know um, who your allies are, who you, who's your greatest opponent, um, you know, what are your, your, st your strategies for the whole thing. So, here we go. I'm just going to paste... This is a video that I have been watching now it's a it's a really good video if you are a matter of fact kind of person not a fear fear monger but it or also it tells you how many minutes that you would have if nuclear thermonuclear war began <laughs> <laughs> right um, and so it takes five minutes to launch to the apogee of the the, uh, it's not an ICBM anymore. I mean, they've also got direct missiles, which will fly like tomahawks just over the water. So it doesn't have to go up and then come down. It just goes straight to the target. But the, the missiles, in, in I think they were called IL, ILMBMs, ILMBMs or something, and they go up and then they split into eight actual detonatable nukes with a whole bunch of decoys and the decoys burn up on entry, and what you're left with is eight, and they go to their targets. So, look, it's it's a terrible technology. It's you know, we, it was created just to protect yourselves, but you know, through protection, you know, Actually, live by the sword, die by the sword, right? You're right. No, the, the thing is this: I mean, the, the technology, the science, the math <coughs> required to, to mm -hmm. create all of this is is quite astonishing, right? It's it's genius. And, and it, again, I say this, uh, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. Just because science has given us a certain power or a certain capability doesn't mean we should use it. Um, because, or use it for something else. You're right, Dave. It is, it is horrible technology, but it's, it is beautiful in its, I guess, simplicity and math and execution. So, so from that point of view, it is astonishing. You know, one day if we were, happened to find a star that hadn't ignited and we threw a nuke into it and detonated it, and it made a star, 
a mm-hmm. thumbs up. You know, mm-hmm. that might be what we need to do with this stuff <clears throat> rather than kill people with it. But um, if you, if you, if you go, <laughs> yes, thanks, I, 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 AV, AV there, ICBMs. No, it's actually the new term. That's intercontinental ballistic missile. Or the new ones are controllable, they're directional, so they're not ballistic. Um, but they do rise to an apogee and fall down again. So it's called an ILBM or something, or, or LBM something. Watch the video and you'll get the, the thing. But look, this it got me wondering about the end of the world. And, you know, we saw 2012 come and go, and which... But Bak- Baktun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we survived the 13th Baktun. Here we are. <laughs> we're on the 13th Baktun. Uh, and um, so that's, you know, we, we made it through that, right? But what it really got me thinking about was, um, uh, you know, what, what's the end of the world and, and what's the end of the world scenarios look like? And, and we have, as a guest today, author of, what's the book, Thomas? Thomas, One Man's Island, is it? Yes. yes awesome. Yes. So we have, the, we have an author, and, um, and he's written it like it's an end of the world scenario, and I think it's, it's going to be pertinent, and it's around this era that we live in, and um, we're lucky to have him on. Thomas, welcome aboard. Shiny side out. I'm uh, happy to be there. Welcome, sir. I'm happy to be there. So, um, when did you... I've got to ask a question. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, um, and, and when did you start writing? So, who Actually, are you? Yes, sir. Hello. Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Um, well, actually, I've had the story in my mind for uh, several years, and it wasn't until um, about a year ago or a year and a half ago that my uh, partner, Catherine, really uh, supported me and uh, convinced me to actually sit down and uh, actually write it and not just have it floating around in my head and saying, um, you know, someday I'll do this, someday I'll do this. And finally, I just like I said, I had her support 100%, and uh, I was actually able to do it. Oh, that's that's awesome. So so what's the book titled? Okay, the book is titled One Man's Island. And it's – and um, and what what's it about? Well, basically, uh, my inspiration was uh, the – several years ago, the History Channel had on uh, shows called uh, Life After People. And uh, the whole post, post-apocalyptic theme had always intrigued me. And what would happen if everybody just either died or just disappeared? What would happen with the earth and, what, and everything that we had left behind? What would happen? And um, what the premise of the book actually is, is um, 100,000 uh, years ago and so many light years away, um, a star burst into a supernova. And the supernova uh, let out a uh, what, what do you call a gamma ray burst that traveled so many thousands and millions and billions of miles to get here to Earth, and nobody really knows what the effects of that would be. Uh, so I just took it upon myself to, with a little poetic license, to just surmise what maybe could happen, and it overnight. This gamma ray burst hit Earth, and everybody on Earth, with the exception of a handful of people, just died. And the story is of the survivors getting along and surviving after this happened. Wow. Oh, that's awesome. I have seen that show, uh, Life After People, yeah, and how, how soon the Earth is able to delete our, our history. Yeah, but it also um, it goes to show that a life after people, it showed all the things that will fail, uh, you know, once we're gone, you know, all the things that will just blow up or leak or, you know, spill acid everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just once you remove the human element. But I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated um, with, with, uh, with your premise of the gamma ray burst because that's, that's a likely enough scenario. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's not too far-fetched. Um, within the book, though, um, you, 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 I think you are concentrating more on the human element as well, aren't you? You're, you're, you're bringing forward, the, the, I guess, the desolation and the relationships is more than, I guess, the, 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 um, the bleakness of it. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, and also I put in a, a, an electromagnetic pulse um, 
premise in with the gamma ray, so where all the electronics fail. Mm -hmm. So here, uh, the survivors are uh, not only are they on a world that's no longer has people on it. None of the um, none of the um, basic things we take for granted today work anymore. Uh, so it's it's also them like trying to get older vehicles to work and driving around and 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 things like that. Yeah, the the non electronic driven vehicles. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now you you said in the pre in the preface of your book that you did a lot of research and um, having read it now, and thank you very much for the soft copy you sent it to Dave or Dave. Well, I don't know. Someone gave me a soft copy. <laughs> so, it was me. All right. Yeah. So I so I so I, I read it. Um, and I have to, I can attest to that you did a lot of research and a lot of the science and uh, and geographies and, and and things that you posted. What what did you find hardest to to come across when you tried to research your book? What was the information that wasn't readily made available to you? I guess. Um. Well. The the most part is the uh, nautical. There's a, a part of it that's on a ship that I really, since I was I was in the army, I wasn't in the navy. Uh, I didn't know a whole lot, so I had to just suppose. And like I said, a lot of um, uh, poetic license or a literary license with what I did on on the ship. But um, but most part now that we have the inter the, the the wonders of the internet, um, that I was able to find out mostly everything uh, in a few a few short weeks, and whatever I didn't know, I was able to find out within several minutes of just doing a quick Google search. And it just everything is so much easier now with the internet, and that's another thing. With the, my book, if you don't have the internet anymore, we'd be back twenty five, thirty, forty years with uh, research. Yeah, absolutely. This is one of the things we talked about is, you know, the, the loss of what we currently have. You know, if we have no electricity, we're farming. Yeah. You know, exactly. that's just that's exactly where we are and, and how quickly things can turn bad uh, with the slightest of nudges. Like, you know, the EMP you mentioned is an extremely quick end of society as we know it. Yeah. Just with no electricity. Exactly. We depend so much on technology these, these days where everything we have, uh, our mobile phones, our cell phones, our cars, our computers we, we're communicating now on in between you and I, mm -hmm. uh, everything is just run by computers. And one, a, in a blink of an eye, it could all be gone and we could be thrown back 100 years in technology. So, so you, you were born in the U.S., yeah? Yes, I was. And um, it yeah. uh, Wow. So where did you grow up? I grew up uh, in Philadelphia. I was born and raised in Philadelphia and um, lived there um, until I was 17 when I went into the Army. I enlisted in the, uh, in the U.S. Army in 1983, and I spent several years in the Army and um, came out and did quite a lot of uh, traveling while I was in the Army in uh, Central America and Europe and uh, came home and was in uh, Philadelphia for – Oh, about 10 years before I moved to Arizona. Then I was in Arizona for several years. Uh, uh, so there, yeah. Yeah, I've been around pretty much a lot of places in my life. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. Can I ask you, um, now since you've written this book, <laughs> and you know, obviously yeah. the subject matter interests you, and you've certainly researched it. Can I ask you, are you yourself prepared for an eventuality? Let's say the light goes out, uh, you know, will, will you be sitting in the dark as well, or are you prepared? No, I, I, I'm pretty well prepared with uh, candles and, and things like that that we could use for light and all that and heat. And where we live here in Australia, it's not really too cold or too uh, terribly hot from what I'm, I'm used to. So. <laughs> It's, it's <laughs> uh, sorry, it, we we hit forty five point three degrees. Uh, not, I think was it last summer for one day. Yes, um, it was a couple of days after Christmas, actually. I think. Yeah, wasn't it? yeah, yeah. If we could, they're killer days. Oh, and, yeah. Um, yeah. So that's pretty tragic. Uh, as long as you've got a basement to go to or something, you can you can stay sort of relatively cool or out of the out of the sun. I'd, the, what interested me about your book was the GRB or the gamma ray burst, mm. and that is that is so plausible. It's it's on the the physics list of of doomsday events. You know we have you know impacts from meteors or comets or you know the sun our sun gives us a kill shot or there's a GRB from a supernova. 
you know, not very far away because, you know, any sun can pop. It's just, right, yeah. it's going to pop, but will it pop in our lifetime or, or has there already been one and there's a wave coming which we don't, we don't, all the stars we see out there, we're looking back in time at these ones and we're not going to know it pops until it hits us. Right, exactly. That's just, well, that was the, the whole uh, theory with my gamma ray burst that nobody would know it happened until it happened. Mm-hmm. It, would, it happened 10,000, the supernova was 10,000 years ago, but nobody on Earth had seen it um, until, boom, wake up, oh, what happened? <laughs> do, do you know what, what's, what's crazy? Was this week we had a sudden illumination of a brand new star. I saw the news on that. That was yeah. amazing. See, it, it's, all of this is possible, and it is possible within our own time frame. The longest... I think it was uh, recorded in China the, um, that the sun had a companion in the sky for more than a week as one of the stars went supernova. Um, it wasn't big enough to cause a gamma ray burst and it didn't turn into a neutron star. It was just it was too small, but it still provided enough light to be a second, st- second sun all day and all night for a week. And, you know, yeah. I, I, what my original thought was with the gamma ray burst was that, you know, if it was a nice close star and it went off, that the burst would come past us and only that side exposed at the very moment that it hit us would be cooked and the rest would sort of make it. But if it's a sustained burst over at least 24-hour period, there's the whole Earth gone. Yeah, yeah. And I've seen I've seen the physics on this, and like you can be to seventeen hundred degrees Fahrenheit outside. Yeah, you need to find a really deep hole and hide yourself for a long time, or ideally have an ark and leave this troubled planet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's awesome. So um, I, I've pasted the link into the chat room, and um, and I, I really urge everyone to to get it. It's a good read, and you know it's. We've seen Revolution, the show. I, would you would you be adverse to this becoming a film? No, not at all. I would love <laughs> to see it become a film. Yeah, I'd, well, I'd like to see that too. Because, yeah. you know, finally they can take physics together with, you know, reality and, and make something that you don't have to leave your brain at the door for. You know, like I said, I did take some, um, you know, literary license with, uh, with some things, some, some aspects. But uh, that was just pure for just pure entertainment value. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, uh, I did research it a lot, and I, I tried to be as technically accurate in most things as possible you know, while, while writing it. And, oh, uh, that's, that's awesome. So how long, are, are you writing another one, or what's, what's, the, what's the plan with this book? Okay, well, the uh, plan right now is I, I signed with a, uh, a publisher. A publisher uh, actually saw it on Amazon when I had self-published it, and uh, liked it so well that they uh, offered me a uh, two-book deal, and I signed with the publisher Permuta Press, who is um, the premier publisher of post-apocalyptic fiction, um, zombies, werewolves, that kind of that kind of uh, genre. Mm-hmm. And um, so it's scheduled to come out in paperback later this year or uh, early next year. In paperback and most po- possibly uh, audiobook, and I am currently now writing the sequel to the book. Who, what I don't have a, a, a name for yet, but uh, I will have a sequel out, and I'm thinking of a third book, so it might work into a trilogy over the next year or so. Wow, that's awesome! Oh, yeah. I, I, I want to see. I want to get the rest of this. That's brilliant. <laughs> Actually, and I would like to read the second and third, to be honest with you. Be good. So, uh, guys, I'm, uh, <coughs> sorry. No, I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, I've, I've gotten a lot of very good reviews, and uh, I'm, I'm hoping everybody that uh, likes this sort of uh, genre will, will buy it and tell all their friends. Oh, look, I, I, I personally, I, I love uh, post-apocalyptic um, Literature I've read, uh, Wolf and Iron, you know, I liked um, all the zombie uh, uh, literature that's come out. But I, I go way back into, uh, you know, like back into the 50s and 60s for my science fiction as well. Right. So you, you write well. It's, it's, easy, it's, it's a very good read, guys. Uh, if you, if you um, 
have the time and inclination to read. I'm hoping that most of our listeners still do. I know that in the world of their reading is becoming a lost art, but you can read it on your iPad as well or your Kindle or whatever it might be. So it's, it's definitely worth, worthwhile to read the science that, I, as far as I can tell anyway, most of it is exactly what it should be. And it is, it is really – what I find interesting is, is it's how people deal with this, right? This is really what, what I find fascinating when it comes to these end-of-world scenarios. And I'll be honest with you. How do people react? What do we do? Do we really want to survive? It's, in my mind, it's always, do I, wanna, do I really want to live through this particular disaster and come out the other end? That, that's something I've always asked myself. Do you ask yourself the same thing? You know, do you really want to live through this and then you know, deal with the aftermath? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I thought. And uh, the – the main characters are all very, very human. They're not uh, like superheroes, mm. like John McClane in um, in uh, that movie uh, Die Hard or anything. Yeah. He's not a superman, <laughs> but um, but the, and the, he does make mistakes, and he's very, very human. And I think a lot of people can identify with it. That's that's what I was hoping for. You know, that uh, he he's not a superman, and he does make mistakes, and he does things that you and I could possibly do. That's, I, I tried to be as you know, thorough with that also, the, the human part of it, where we're not all perfect and that you know, we get things wrong a lot of times. Yeah, and, and that, look, and, and, but this is what I found interesting. And this is what I found interesting about but when people write about this. I don't want to read you know, about some Superman that, that can do anything they want and, you know, and they, they have the ability to make fire you know, just by thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> so now it's, it's, it's more interesting to see the the interesting, <clears throat> the interesting uh, human uh, uh, frailties and, and, and our struggles, as it were, right? I mean, this is this is what we're interested in. We want to know how, how how could we struggle through this, you know? And, and the more realistic it is, the more interesting it is for us. Because most of the survivors today, and this goes out to everybody in listener land, there, guys, most of the people today lack the skills to survive a day in the forest. Okay, if you if you're a woodsman, great. Most of us aren't. I mean, I can, I guess, Dave, and you know, obviously. <clears throat> Some other people can as well, but the vast majority of, of the people in the world are city dwellers. They wouldn't have a clue on how to start a fire. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's, that's really, uh, I think, quite telling these days. <laughs> I was actually thinking about that this week, about how I could construct a string bow to wrap around a stick to be able to rub back as a, you know, roll it, mm-hmm. rather than doing it by two hands. And I was thinking about making that mechanism so that I'm able to do that, because it, it's not, we don't you know, not everywhere is going to be a place where you can keep a roaring fire going 24-7 because you'd, you'd end up looking like Arnold Schwarzenegger having to chop that much wood. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, I know because we've had a fire in winter times here and it's, you know, oh, it, you don't want to have to keep facing that, that wood chopping. But I was, I was thinking you know, that's some of, some of the the things that you know the reader gets from this is how they would because they attach to the character really well and, and how they're going to have to deal with this should they should they fall should it fall into their lap yeah 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 it's it's <clears throat> like I said the um, the main character is a as a grizzled old uh, sergeant major in the army so he has a little bit more survival skills than the average person but the people he meets along the way don't. And he has his own frailties too, and um, yeah, he just he just goes along. He makes mistakes just like everybody else, also. But he's also able to pull things together and get people to, you know, think about survival. When actually, in the very beginning, he was ready to give up because um, he didn't know how to psychologically handle it. Yeah, you look. You raise a good point. We, I know that with a group of my friends, I've I've had this dinner. Dinner discussion with them. They surely hate me for it, but um, it's you know, what would you do if this? And I like I like to run scenarios, and my poor long suffering friends, those that remain, um, do you know what? Most of them say that I'd just be happy as from themselves. Go down to the bottle o and the bottle shop and buy some alcohol and drink my way until whatever consume me consume me or took me and i said you seem like a fighting kind of person are you really sure that you do that you know and that's the question that i ask them and i'd like for them to um i might push what i might do is as um said maybe i'll buy your book for them there you go thomas yeah yeah there you go there you go and see if i can 
see if I can get them across this because you know my friends are the people who had want to live through this. Yeah, yeah. It's like I said, it's it's all a matter of survival, and it's all survival. I've always learned is ninety nine percent mental. It's all psychological. You have to want to survive. Yes, like that. Correct. That's the positive take-home message right there. But that's true. That's 100% correct. There were in stories from Siberia in prison camps, or prisons of war. Some survived, some didn't. Not because of anything but their mind state or state of mind. They, some just gave up hope, gave up hope, and laid down and died. That's what happened. My uncle was there, or great uncle, I should say. He told me. And mm-hmm. the others just lived because they said, no, nah, I'm going to live through this. And others said, well, I, I, I don't think I will. So, boom. From you know, they they weren't sick, they weren't injured. They just lied down, and gave up their goals. So you're right. You must want to live. You must want to survive. Exactly, exactly. It's and I found a, a lot of things in my life. Um, I went to uh, ranger school and and uh, parachute. Par- I was a paratrooper, and it was all psychological. I just I had to want to win. I had to want to uh, complete everything and if there were some people that were yes in my platoon that were more physically strong than me the more they had uh, more stamina and everything but they didn't have the mental strength to complete it to complete these schools and that's all like i said with everything in life it's all mental it's all psychological huh. and that's and like i'm hearing everything about this is is it's basically putting that message into the reader's head, yeah? I really like that. Because, you know, that's what's lacking. When when I see all this, you know, the prepper stuff and, you know, um, you know, I hear people talk about the doom and gloom. We're realists. I'm a realist. I know Mackie's a realist. We're not a... We certainly don't sit in our pit of despair, hoping that things are going to get better. We, we're, at, we're, at, we're actually we're action people trying to make it happen. I, I like that pit of despair. It's a nice little picture. <laughs> well, you know, Crystal Castle. Oh, yeah. you, you know, pit of it's despair. True. Someone's going to have a pit of despair out there somewhere. I'm going to make mine a barbecue. It's filled with crud. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> well, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's like all the preppers in the world. They can have. As many um, you know, cans of baked beans and rounds of ammunition or rolls of toilet paper, but when the, you get down to the brass tacks and where the rubber meets the road, yep. uh, you could have all that stuff and lose the will to survive, and you could uh, and you could die, you know, just by merely giving up, like uh, Macy said. Yeah, yeah. See, and that, like that's that's tough. So, like, I'm glad your your book's got that positive message in there. And um, is there is there one, just a you know a, a quick, a quick story like a quick scene, that that might be um, you know, a teaser. Oh, okay. There's uh, you mentioned dolphins earlier, mm-hmm. in, uh, in before I, I, when my microphone was still muted. Uh, but uh, yes, there's um, there's a dolphin story on there, and it's uh, very humorous. It's. Uh, Humorous and very subtle that, that leads toward the end of the book. Uh, I think it, everybody would get a kick out of it if they catch the subtlety of it so much. Oh, that's good. Because I've heard that they can help survivors and things like that. Exactly, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah a, that, that sounds really good. Um, thank you so much for your time. And um, we've tried to get you on, but you know, both of us have had some... Um, scheduling issues exactly. and um but it's been a, an absolute pleasure having you on the show you're welcome to um to stay through the the uh, the second half if you if you will it's our show is normally very action-packed and we'll we're oh. going to um cover off uh we might announce that at the second half of the hour <laughs> okay, okay. after we come back from the break yeah. which is is going to be upon us uh within about a minute or two yeah, just so everybody though once again this is one man's island a novel by thomas j wolfenden Okay, Wolfenden, W O L F E N D E N, and One Man's Island. <laughs> so rush out and buy your copy if you can, or wait for the paperback as you wish. Or click on the link that's in the chat room. Also good. And for those of you who will be listening to this after the fact, it'll be in the show notes uh, that we post beneath the video. So, um, um, yeah, that's that's extraordinary. I. D- 
Um, oh, by the way, this is listener-funded radio, <laughs> and if you like what you hear, um, please navigate yourself to, even if you're listening to this on, U- on YouTube, please navigate yourself to Revolution Radio, which is www.freedomslips.com. Pick the new site, go into the chat room, and on the left-hand side, there's a donate button. If you donate during our show, it tells the, the station owner that you've liked our show. Please do that. Um, we it, This is not free. It's We don't make any money from this. And I know that listener base is so significant that if every single person just put one dollar, donated one dollar... I would um, retire. <laughs> <laughs> What about me, Mickey? You can retire also. <laughs> awesome. Uh, only if the money came to us. Yes. If you like the work that Mickey and I do, you can go to shinysideout.net and there's a donate button at the top right-hand side of that, just quietly. Um, and also, um, have a look for my book on, on Amazon. But anyway, um, uh, Thomas, it, that's been it's absolutely been a pleasure having you on. And um, when when you've got your next book ready... Please, can you give us a, a, a little tidbit of that as well when it comes back? I'd be more than happy to. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, damn, we must be like 30 seconds away from the music. <laughs> <laughs> Almost. Now, look, but uh, it, I, I really I really do in, enjoy the read, and I'm not just saying because you're on our show. And I'm an avid reader. I read uh, between five and six books a week. Um and uh, usually at night, I'm a fast reader as well. So that's all the time my work allows me uh, to, oh, to do. You're a sponge. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and there's the music. <laughs> Told you 30 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> okay. Stay with us after the break, Shiny Side Outers. no denying the world is awakening. We see it in the global uprisings and demonstrations of the people around the planet and the new way of thinking and living that is... There is no denying the world is awakening. We see it in the global uprisings and demonstrations of the people around the planet and the new way of thinking and living that is arising naturally within each one of us and our communities. I have been a major player in this global shift and movement for over 20 years and have helped tens of thousands of people around the world change their lives and find their voice in order to help create the paradigm change we so desperately need. Join me here at Revolution Radio on the Just Bernard Show every Tuesday at noon Eastern. Eastern Time for two hours of powerful interviews and discussion with some of the most influential visionaries of consciousness, alternative media, and suppressed knowledge. We promise to reveal the real matrix and empower your human experience. I can hear him banging. He's trying to get in. He's getting close to the door. I'm going to go ahead and get the gun out. It's a shotgun. It's large. Every time our country stands in the path of danger, an instinct seems to summon her finest first. Those who truly understand her. When freedom shivers in the cold shadow of true peril, it's always the patriots who first hear the call. Be here Monday through Friday with Clayton Douglas, the free American, right here on Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. Don't miss each and every show. We should be fantastic adventure into ideas of freedom and liberty. Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps. Yes, folks, that's Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. till noon Eastern.
your data safe? Do you have the necessary information to assist you in confidently living through just about any survival situation? Is survival from gardening, off-grid living, medical knowledge, or even natural or man-made EMPs on your list of personal concerns? Do you have your documents and your personal information in a safe place in your hands where you know where it is? Well, check out our preloaded EMP-proof thumb drive. Over three gigs of survival documents and how-tos, plus the USDA offline food preservation website, and much, much more, including a surprise bonus we just can't tell you about here. With plenty of room left over to store your most important documents. Imagine if a mega virus or a computer failure took out your bank, or all the banks for that matter. Are your banking records safe in your hands so when they get things fixed and repaired, you can say, hey, look, this is what I had. You have it. I want it back. Is your personal data safe? family records, addresses, phone numbers, we'll squeeze on over to freedomslips.com. Yes, that's www.freedomslips.com. Click the banner on the homepage for the EMP proof bullet drive to get the full scoop of everything that we offer. So folks, keep your data safe for your peace of mind. Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. You don't need to expect us. We're already here. Thank you for tuning in to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. If you plan to call in and speak with one of our hosts, please turn down your radio and separate yourself from any background noise and wait for the area code to be called on before you speak. And don't forget, Revolution Radio freedomslips.com is listener supported. So stop by the homepage, freedomslips.com, visit the site support area to help support the host you're listening to's airtime. Thank you. Revolution Radio freedomslips.com, where the truth never sleeps. Revolution Radio. You're listening to Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. You're back with Dave and Mickey Shiny Side Out on freedomslips.com. This is Listen to Funder Radio. If you like what you hear, please go to freedomslips.com and push the donate button on the site support page. It's on the left-hand side in the chat. Your donation is greatly appreciated and helps run this station. We are halfway through show number 77. 70 and 7. <laughs> we are talking about, today, on the second half of the show, Hollow Earth. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we did that show, it was show 11, in fact, the last it time. It was show was. 11. So 66 shows ago. Right? Oh my goodness! <laughs> it's all it's all working out. <laughs> um, and and um, we um, we thought it would be interesting to take another, I guess, angle on it um, than we did last time. Last time we brought a whole bunch of facts to you guys, and we will do the same thing again today, uh, slightly updated, I think. But <clears throat> the key thing here is to remember that today's show, oh sorry, today's second half, not the first half, <laughs> the second half. Is uh, is a tinfoil head zone, all of it. Okay, um, there's no empirical evidence for any of the things we're going to say. There's some, uh, I guess, historical evidence. There's some uh, anecdotal evidence, some literary evidence. Hearsay. <coughs> Hearsay. Yes, absolutely. Legends, myths. You know, you name it. It's all there. But <clears throat> I don't know anybody. Uh, I don't know anyone or in any group or organization that has actually gone into the earth. And I'm not talking about a cave system here. I'm talking about into the earth and explored it um, at any length. And um, I'm not saying that anyone has. What I am saying is that, that we just don't know enough to categorically say, nay, it is not so. Um, because there's some things that just don't make any sense. So this is my warning for you. The entire show is a tinfoil head zone. Please fasten your seat belts. Adjust your tinfoil heads, ensuring the shiny side is correctly yeah. facing outward. And keep your arms inside your reality suspension module at all times. Okay? And no flash photography. No, none of that. <laughs> um, now, uh, what I wanted to discuss with you guys is one of my favorite... Um, yeah, he's one of my favorite authors. When I was a child, I, I read all his books. I loved them. Uh, I'm talking, of course, about Jules Verne. 
Jules Verne, you might know uh, from, from an 80 Days Around the World, uh, you know, Captain Nemo, you know, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, The Mysterious Island, um, you know, all those wonderful and imaginative uh, books, Five Weeks in a Balloon, for instance, as well. Now, the funny thing about Jules Verne is this. Um, he, he never purported to be a prophet. He never said, oh, yeah, I'm going to predict the future. Not at all. He was interested in the human aspect of, of all of these things. So he, he wrote about the people. He put them in extraordinary situations and gave them, you know, I guess, amazing scientific breakthroughs. But he never set out to predict the future. At least so he said. Fair enough. You know, he was French. Yes. Um, which means nothing. <laughs> That's why he had that outrageous accent. <laughs> Correct. Um, but he, he, he did make astonishing uh, predictions which came true. Uh, in fact, most of them have. And this is why I'm mentioning him uh, at the be- beginning of this particular segment. Um, he um, spoke about uh, fast uh, travel in 80 days around the world. When he, when he was writing this in the, in the 19th century, that was astonishing. Really, in 80 days? How is that possible? You can't possibly go around the world in 80 days. Remember, there was no flight. There was no aviation. You know? there, was, there was no... Um, uh, <clears throat> A, a supersonic aircraft that could take you around. There was, there was no high-speed uh, 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 um, naval or ocean vessels. I mean, they were fast enough, but they weren't traveling the world in 80 days. But, but he said, no, you know what? Um, it, my, my character will travel around the world in 80 days. And, and lo and behold, he did. Um, in fact, he didn't know it, um, but that's a, you should read the book if you want to see the details there. Five Weeks in a Balloon. He, the balloon that he had in his uh, particular uh, book there was a, a, a balloon that could be steered. Again, something that wasn't he, he didn't think was possible, or he, he didn't think would become possible to steer a balloon across the African continent. You know, a balloon was was more or less um, uh, fancy to the air, correct, to the wind. I, I love your poetic description. Yes, a, a fancy to the wind. You're 100 percent correct. So, uh, and not only that, though, he, he, the the Nautilus, probably the most famous creation of his, the, the submarine, which kept Nemo, which in Latin actually means nobody. In case you wanted. Um, uh, really? It means, yeah, it means n- nobody. Nemo means nobody, yep. Uh, very huh. pertinent. Um, now, um, I know this because I did Latin. Much, much to my chagrin and waste of time. <laughs> anyway, but there you are. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so, so the Nautilus was a submarine. Uh, and, and something, again, something that was uh, quite far-sighted of him. Uh, he, he spoke about uh, the first man in the moon. Oh, sorry, the journey to the moon, I should say. The first man on the moon was H.G. Wells. Um, so the, the, the journey to the moon, and again, he describes a great projectile that would be launched at the moon as well. And, and all of the things that he spoke about, all of them pretty much came true. We have submarines today. We can travel you know, vast distances very quickly. In fact, uh, it, is now, it is now hard to travel the world in 80 days um, in fact, in as, as little as 80 days. You know, you, it's very difficult to find the, the kind of transport that you would require to travel around the world in 80 days because those shipping lines don't exist anymore. The overland connections don't exist anymore. Um, you know, we're all very much uh, reliant on, on airplanes. So how, how, how is it then that he made these accurate predictions? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe he had some uh, – maybe he was lucky. I, I really don't know, but but the point is they, they they were made and they came true. Jules Verne is probably he's got the best track record of all the science fiction authors that I know, and you know it's a, you can argue that what he wrote is is not science fiction anymore because it's all there. Well, not when he was writing it. <laughs> okay, so one day we might have faster than light travel, and you know all of our science fiction authors all of, all of a sudden just become adventure authors. Yeah, uh, Arthur C. Clarke and Asimov, because you know. Um, it is no longer science fiction. It is now just an adventure novel set no, in, a, in a real world. It, be, it, 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 it comes from someone's imagination as science fiction, and hmm. science makes it happen, which then means it's science fact. Yeah, and it just becomes the background for an ordinary adventure story, right? So, mm-hmm. um, and that, that's, that's right. So, so you had the submarine there. You know, he, he, he described a, a balloon that could be uh, navigated you know, through the air. He spoke about a flight to the moon, all of those wonderful things, and they all happened to come true. Now, one thing, though, he wrote about, which hasn't come true yet, was the journey to the center of the earth. And that's why I'm mentioning him here, right? It's actually a <coughs> method to my madness. <laughs> uh, the, the journey to the center of the world. Um, again, a, a fairly detailed book about um, a, a scientist and his nephew, uh, with the help of, of, of local men in, in, I think it was in Iceland they went to, and I've got to lie to you now, it's been a while since I've read it, and they, they descend into this, this massive volcano, uh, which, which apparently uh, happens to hold one of the entrances to the underworld, and, and they, 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 do, they do descend, 
at a specific time of the year, though, it has to be because it has to be ice free and whatnot. Or, you know, the water has to be uh, away as well. Um, and they they descend in, in this wonderful world uh, of dinosaurs and gigantic mushrooms, and you know, it, it is essentially a hollow or a massively uh, caveated world that he encounters. Um, and and to this day, we have not had uh, official. Um, how can I put this best? Uh, um, uh, an official claim or official statement that would say yes, there are in fact massive cavernous systems within the Earth. You know, while I'm not pro- uh, postulating here that the Earth is hollow, again, I don't know it is, but I'm saying I'm not saying it is. What I'm saying is I believe there are massive cavern systems mm. within the Earth um, that that could possibly uh, hold <coughs> ancient civilizations and animals that were, um, you know, extinct but uh, on the or surface or unknown. But- Unknown, yep. yeah, absolutely. Yep. In fact, for the longest time, people believed because they kept finding these these frozen uh, mammoths and such um, that they were uh, coming out of the interior of the Earth. Um, you know, in 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 these these um, I guess icebergs, as it were. <clears throat> and then they were found in Siberia and, and elsewhere, having uh, having st- having been stranded there. Well, that was the going theory, anyway. Now we know that may not be true, but uh, then again, who knows what is going on? So. Why then is this, this particular one that hasn't come true yet? Why, why, why is it that this would be something, if it were true, and he's got a pretty good track record, Mr. Verne, if it were true, then why, why would this be kept from us? Well, a number of reasons, of course. And you have to understand here that all cultures all over the world believe in some kind of underground world. Everybody. Okay, there's not one culture that doesn't have that, and I'm going to give you a couple here only. Okay, the Greek have something called the Hades. The Nordics, you know, the the Swedish and the Danes and you know the crazy Germans, they've got something called Svart Alfheim. There's also the Christian Hell and the Jewish Shoal, with details describing inner Earth in uh, Kabbalistic literature. So that's that's the, the secret writings, if you will, of of, of the Jewish people. Now. Um, Vedic texts, <coughs> such as the Puranas, uh, according uh, to one story in the Puranas, there is a, an ancient city called Shambhala, which is located inside the earth. Um, the belief in Shambhala as a city inside the earth is also found in Tibetan Buddhism. Shambhala you might also know as uh, Shangri-La. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Or, or, you know, the, the, I thought it sounded familiar. Exactly. Or, or, the, or even Agathi might, have, might be another familiar term uh, yep. uh, that you've heard before. Now, So the point I'm making here is that each culture, and it's, it's, by the way, the Chinese and the Japanese also have, have underworld stories, you know, underground stories or, or stories of, of, of underground kingdoms, as it were. The king under the mountain. If you're of European descent, you probably know that one. Um, what are the demons? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Right? Where do they live? In, in, in the earth. And it's usually a bad place underground, right? It's usually a place you don't want to go to. Uh, Rip Van Winkel goes underground, eats the food and sleeps for 100 years. Not something you necessarily want to do because when he comes back up, everybody is gone that he used to know. So mm-hmm. there are stories of, of um, underground, let's call them city, city civilizations, uh, goings on, as it were, uh, that, that we can't quite um, put away without considering because they are in every culture. They are in, everywhere. in South America, Mackie, as well. Yeah, 100% correct, sir. Mm-hmm. Again, it, it, is, it is the underworld, right? Um, wh- why is that? And don't forget, not, not all of these people used to bury their dead. Okay? The, the Nordics used to burn them. Okay? Uh, before the advent of Christianity, most of Northern Europe didn't, didn't bury their dead. Um, similarly with, with uh, the Indians. Indians never buried their dead. They burned them as well. So, so it, it is not as natural to think of an underworld uh, as it would be for us in our current cultural environment. You know, we, we, we do bury people <coughs> in the ground. So it's, it's a small step to think, oh, well, you know, you bury them in the ground, therefore in the ground, underground, there's some kind of afterlife, as it were. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so uh, in fact, not all, not all the cultures did that. Um, North American Indians didn't do it either. Um, the burning was a very common, in fact, of, of, of the dead. So, so why, the why Vikings, the Vikings, Vikings yes, sir. and um, uh, also... Um, oh, if you oh, Stonehenge people. Yes, the Druids. Yeah, the Druids burning. Yep, they, yes, would, they, were, they used to burn people too. Yeah, and look, and, and that's right, Dave. Right? So, I mean, so so there is this this thread that runs through culture, through civilization, that associates 
I guess, bad things to some extent or, or deathly things with an underground world or with an mm-hmm. underground, you know, uh, kingdom, as it were. Um, and then I find this fascinating. And then if you take into consideration all the other legends that you have around, uh, um, you know, people hiding in the earth or, or you remember when we did the show around the flood myths, you know, people coming out of the earth, you know, and, and having been saved, I guess, in underground caverns or cities, you know, from the flood, as it were, back in the day. So, so we, we can't just say, no, not true, doesn't happen. And we found a lot of cities that are underground now. And they're, not, they're not miles and miles underground, mind you, but, you know, we found underground cities all over the world as well. What about in Turkey? Exactly. Turkey is riddled. It's honeycombed, <laughs> pardon the pun, with cities underground. Um, and uh, quite uh, well-established cities for, for thousands of people. You know, this is, these are large little troglodyte dwellings, you know, little caves where people just, you know, knock a couple bones together and um, hope for the best. Now, these, these are well-planned cities. with irrigation. They could have hundreds, I think it was about a thousand people and, and livestock. Yeah, no, actually, it, one of the cities had, had, had uh, room for thousands. Yep. Um, and I forget now which one, but it was massive. No, but you're right, though. Yeah, it, livestock, yeah, it, it was, it was a, a dwelling place. You know, it wasn't just some kind of makeshift thing. Now, there, there's more, though. There's more. In, in, um, according to, to ancient Greeks, there were caverns under the surface which were entrances leading to the underworld, very much like Jules Verne's uh, uh, book itself, and he might have drawn his inspiration from here. And, and some of uh, um, uh, which were the caverns at, at Tainaron, which is in Lyconia. There's one at Trosian in Argolis. There's one at Ephia, which is in uh, Thesprotia. Uh, also one at Heracleia, which is in Pontus, and one in Hermione. In Thracian and Dacian um, legend, it is said there are underground chambers occupied by an ancient god called Zalmoxis. In Mesopotamian religion, there's a story of a man who, after traveling through the darkness of a tunnel in the mountain of Mashu, entered a subterranean garden. In Celtic mythology, there's a legend of a cave called Kruachan, also known as Ireland's Gate to Hell, a legendary and ancient cave from which, according to legend, say that strange creatures would emerge in ancient times and be seen on the surface of the earth. There are also stories of medieval knights and saints who went on pilgrimages to a cave located in Station Island, County Donegal, in Ireland, where they made journeys inside the earth in, uh, into a place of purgatory. There's an Irish myth which uh, says tunnels in County Down, Northern Ireland, lead to the land of the subterranean Tuatha de Danaan, a group of people who are believed to have introduced Druidism, thank you Dave, <laughs> to <laughs> Ireland, and then went back underground. Mm-hmm. An ancient legend of the Angami Naga tribes of India claims that their ancestors emerged in ancient times from subterranean land inside the earth. There are legends from the Taino people that their ancestors emerged in ancient times from two caves in a mountain on the ground. It is the belief of the natives of the Malinovsky's uh, uh, Trobriand Islands that their ancestors had come from a subterranean land through a, a cavern hole called Opkukula. There's also an ancient legend uh, in Mexico, uh, which holds that a cave in a mountain five miles south of Ojinaga, Mexico, is possessed by devilish creatures who came from inside the earth. There was an ancient myth held in the Middle Ages that some mountains located between Eisenach and Gotha in Germany holds a portal to the inner earth. There's an old Russian legend that says the Samoyeds, an ancient Siberian tribe, traveled to an underground cavern city to live inside the earth. In Native American mythology, it is said that the ancestors of the Mandan people in ancient times emerged from a subterranean land through a cave at the north side of the Missouri River. There's also a tale about a tunnel in the San Carlos Apache Indian Reservation in Arizona, near Cedar Creek, which is said to lead inside the earth to a land inhabited by, by, sorry, to a land inhabited by a mysterious tribe. It is also the belief of the tribes of the Iroquois that their ancient ancestors emerged from a subterranean world inside the earth. The elders of the Hopi believe that a Sipaku or Sikapu entrance in the Grand Canyon exists, which leads to the underworld. It just keeps going. And there's, there's more here, and I will share these with you as well. According to South American mythology, the belief of the Brazilian Indians, who live alongside the Parima River in Brazil, claimed that their forefathers emerged in ancient times from an underground land, and that many of their ancestors still remain inside the earth. There's also a legend that says the ancestors of the Inca Empire came from underground caves, 
which are located um, east of uh, Cusco in Peru. Mm-hmm. Now, guys, this is, um, you know, these, these are all mythologies we've just briefly mentioned to you, which, which have their own depth and detail if you want to look them up for yourselves, and they'll be part of the show notes and so forth. Now, all of this, all of this, none of it being empirical evidence, unfortunately, points to the fact that there is something going on on the inside of the Earth. Would you agree, Dave? Oh, completely. Absolutely, completely. Joe, you know, um, just to back up some of those stories already, right, real quick, yeah, yeah. is we're seeing the... We're, we're seeing this information coming, especially from South America, recently, because they've just unearthed another, you know, um, a, a temple from the Inca times, uh, possibly earlier, um, and it described the the place where there was a tunnel with bioluminescence lighting up the whole thing. Yes. And, and I'd, I'm perplexed by that because there was a fellow who's now gone, he's deceased, who had been collecting items from the cave, which were unique metals with odd symbols on them. Mm-hmm. And uh, upon his death, everything of his disappeared, no doubt. Mm-hmm. So... I'm really, I, I stare down this stuff and, you know, I, I think it was um, Wild Bob also said in the chat room, uh, just for those listening on YouTube, please go to the chat room while we're on air, it's awesome. Um, Wild Bob says, caves are the best place to survive the crossing. Mm-hmm. Now imagine if these stories are from our flood story, our flood show, where people are saying, you know what? Our we came because we're on a mountain, or, or you know, the the reason why this this town is alive now is because we came, we hid in the cave when the flood was on. Yep. You know, we don't know. Yep. This is the best information we've got. Remember, this is a tinfoil hat zone. It is absolutely. <laughs> Thanks for reminding us, Dave. <laughs> and and guys, be aware as well, right? This is a key thing here. Um, the thickness of the Earth's crust ranges from roughly two miles. Um, at the at the mid ocean ridges to about I think it's thirty forty miles in thickness on the some continental mountain ranges. Okay, so an overall depth of about twenty five miles, thirty five kilometers. That's that's how thick the crust is that we know about. Okay, now um, why am I saying this? Because we haven't really dug very deep into it. What's the deepest hole we've ever dug? And I'm coming to that. I've got that somewhere here because I know I put it here. Uh, we haven't really dug very. Oh, here we go. The deepest hole that we have drilled to date is the SG3 borehole, which is 12.3 kilometers, which is 7.6 miles deep. It is part of the Soviet Kola Super Deep Borehole Project. And, um, and therefore, you know, a visual knowledge of the Earth's structure extends exactly that far. Now, that's, that's actually nothing, if you think about it, 12.3 kilometers, right? Um, because the thing is this. You've got the, the continental um, and, and oceanic shelf, if you will, between 35 and uh, 70 kilometers in thickness. And and then you've got – that's in the upper mantle, right? So in the upper mantle and the lower mantle, the mantle of the Earth, measure 2,900 kilometers, okay? And then you've got the core, which measures another 3,500 kilometers. So all together, you're looking at uh, six and a bit uh, – six and a half thousand kilometers, and and out of that, we have drilled twelve. <laughs> okay, so that's that's only that's not that's still just scratching the surface. Yeah, we exactly. Look, if you were looking at an orange, you you'd be scratching the, the you'd be scratching to get at the uh, at the oils. You know, your, the aromatic oils and the peel. That's what you'd be doing. You wouldn't even gone through the orange part. You wouldn't have got to the white bit. Nah, the exactly. Pith. <laughs> that's exactly right. Yeah. So so. So all of the all of the things that we think we know about the Earth are necessarily uh, deductions, and they're good deductions. It's good. It's good science. Don't get me wrong, right? So we believe there is a magnetic field around the Earth because inside the Earth you've got molten iron, which is moving against itself. So you've got molten iron rubbing against molten iron, or semi-solid iron, um, to create the magnetic field because a magnetic field doesn't just exist right it, 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 especially ours it has to it has to uh, come about so you, you can have a magnetic rock yeah it's magnetically charged but how do you charge a rock in the first place right so so how does a magnetic field exist and and you can do that yourself as well you know if, if you rub two pieces of iron together you know you get you get a um, 
you get a certain effect, and and especially if it's, it's if it's hot iron. Now, so so that's that's what's happening here. So you've got, so that's our deduction. So we think there's molten liquid in there. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. Um, but we we just don't know really what's in there. We haven't drilled deep enough. It it, it gets too hot, right? It it really does get too hot. I mean, I, I've never. I don't know if you've been to a mine shaft. I was lucky enough once in Germany. I went. I can't remember how deep I went. Maybe a kilometer. Maybe two but we were visiting one from school and it was a coal mine not open cut obviously it was was you know it was it was a deep deep a, a deep mine shaft mine. down to a cavern correct and it was hot it was really hot i mean they had they had you know uh, ventilators going to get the air fresh and whatever but it was it was really really hot so you know there might be something to it that there's a, a certain heat and certainly the pressure is massive as well you yeah, don't forget that as well there's massive pressure we can't even dive to, to, to the depth that we would like to go to. Not, not with uh, humans, as far as I know, at least. I don't think um, we've, uh, we've dived with, uh, with people down the San uh, um, Marine uh, Trench. Uh, because, uh, what's his name? Um, the, uh, the, the, arch- the, the, the architect, the director, uh, Cameron, James Cameron. I know he, mm-hmm. he, he, he did a uh, deep dive. I don't know if it was with people or not, but that was the deepest deep dive we'd ever done. And that's just diving. That's not drilling through rock. Uh, you know, and and the pressure that accumulates as well, because you don't just drill, you just also have to have to um, uh, ward off the pressure and the temperature differentials, you know, that that you encounter as you drill deeper. Okay, so it's some fun facts about the Earth are this: the Earth's circumference at the equator is twenty four thousand nine hundred miles, which is forty thousand kilometers. We all know that. That's wrapping a tape measure around it. Correct, sir. The Earth's circumference between the North and the South Pole is 24,859. So we're slightly oblong, you know, not, not pronounced so, but slightly. Um, the Earth's diameter, the equator diameter, right, straight through, is 7,926 miles, which is 12,700 kilometers. Okay? The Earth's diameter at the poles is 7,899, 12,700. Again, slightly off. So it's a little flattened at the poles, if you will, right? It's a little flatter. It's because of the, the centrifugal force pulling out um, on our plane, on the uh, ecliptic. So um, the, the pressure pulling on our Earth to the middle component, like the, the equa- equatorial region, mm. um, on our ecliptic, as well on our rotational plane with the sun and our solar system, it pulls out, and we know that water even pulls out even further than that. So it's an accentuator. If you had a, if you had a, ba- a basketball in front of you and just squash it down a little bit, that's the shape of the Earth. Yes, exactly right. That's exactly right. Now let's talk about gravity for a second, because that's a problem. <laughs> well, gravity is a problem in general, but in this particular thing, it is for for the hollow Earthers. Uh, gra- gravity may, may present an issue, but they're quite clever about it. And if you visualize it, I explain why it's quite clever. So it's the center of the gravity sup- is supposed to be at the center of the Earth. <laughs> Makes sense. It's, a, it's the commonly accepted theory. I mean, nothing else would make sense. Um, if, however, the Earth were hollow, then, then where would that center of gravity be? Well, the hollow, hollow Earthers say, well, you know what? We, we don't need it to be at the um, center of the Earth. We're going to put it into the mantle. And that makes sense as well, because you know, if if you put the center of gravity in the mantle, which is, if, if we remember, is, is two thousand nine hundred kilometers thick, right? Two thousand nine hundred kilometers. Um, then you know you can walk on either side, making mm-hmm. it feasible. like we could if it was a a space station, yeah. rotating. Boom! E- exactly. Now, and this is an interesting thing, because this is something that is you might have seen in movies, and it's true. If you rotate. If you rotate your space station at a certain speed and it has a certain mass, that rotational force, the centrifugal force, will create a gravitational effect. So you will be able to feel up and down. Whereas if you're just floating in space without a rotational factor, yeah, no, no vector that's rotating, you will just float about, like a, like a space shuttle. Okay, or even the space station that we have today, it, nothing rotates there. There's no gravity that we create. If our space stations were sufficiently large and we got them rotating, we could create artificial gravity uh, and, and um, you know, approximate up and down uh, for us while we're there. Um, and, and, and that's sort of what the uh, uh, hollow earthers are saying. This is, how we, this is how this works as well. Okay, fair enough. Makes sense from their point of view. <laughs> now, <laughs> This, this, this was my favorite part last time we did this. Um, there's a history of the, ho- of the hollow earth uh, theories, of course, uh, as there is with most things. And there are four main theories. 
Uh, and, and this is down the rabbit hole, guys. So if you want to hold my hand, feel free. Come with us. <laughs> um, the hollow earth theory has been around for a long, long time. Um, in fact, longer probably than, than the solid earth theory. Um, while the first concepts were crude, uh, this uh, crazy idea in inverted commerce has slowly developed into a viable alternative to the solid earth model. Well, that's what the hollow earthers are saying, right? In light from today's technology, many of our findings point to what a hollow structure is the only method to explain many of today's scientific findings. Hmm. Right. Now, what are the, 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 the main hollow earth models? Uh, there's the concentric spheres hollow earth model, the polar holes hollow earth model, the inverted earth hollow earth model, this is my favorite by far, and the complete shell hollow earth model, which is the expanding earth model. Now, <clears throat> um, Edmund Haley, you might recall, uh, of Haley Comet's fame, um, he, he proposed the earliest hollow earth concept in 1692. Well, the earliest that we know of in scientific uh, circles, if you will. Uh, his ideas were developed while trying to understand the earth's magnetic field. In order to explain the complex movements in the field, Haley concluded that there must be at least four concentric shells each with their own magnetic properties. The movement of each shell relative to the others allowed distinctive, uh, distinctive areas of the field to wander around the globe. Now, of course, today, like I explained, that has been taken over as a theory by the explanation of, of molten interior, of a molten interior, um, which, which moves around and creates that very magnetic field. Okay? Now, um, the most <coughs> famous uh, hollow earth model includes huge polar holes between um, 2,000 and 4,000 kilometers across uh, that open to the interior of the planet. In this theory, the center of the planet har uh, harbors a central sun that provides light and heat to the world within. Hmm. Right, so. And then there's the inverted hollow earth model. Um, this little known concept is the most bizarre of all the hollow earth ideas, and, and I agree. That's why I love it so much. Um, it works on the principle that we are actually living inside a hollow planet right now. Okay? We are living inside a hollow planet right now. And the center of the planet is a point infinitely far away. All okay, my head's exploding. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, look, bear with me, okay? <laughs> <laughs> All the other planets, the moon, satellites, and the sun revolve around this central point. Now, we're talking almost like a TARDIS kind of arrangement here, Right? Inside is bigger than outside. It's, it's a very strange... We are living on the inside of the sphere, okay? And everything on the inside, we're looking up. That's actually on the inside. The sun, the moon, the galaxies, is all on the inside of that particular sphere. <coughs> Not necessarily the most elegant theory, but certainly the craziest. <laughs> <No>. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Uh, my apologies. I told you I'm suffering from all kinds of diseases. And the next <laughs> one is the complete shell hollow earth model. Now, this is apparently the most advanced hollow earth model, and it's based on a combination of the hollow earth and expanding earth theories. It provides an alternative explanation for the drifting continents phenomenon, thus making the tired plate tectonics theory obsolete. <laughs> well, I didn't know it was that tired, but fair enough. Uh, based on our current understanding of gravity, the land of no horizons shows <clears throat> how the accumulation of matter during the planet forming process, naturally produces a planet structured differently to what is currently theorized. It is also uh, shown how a planet hollows out and expands under its own gravitational power. Now, you actually see this. If you have something and it's, ex it's uh, exposed to centrifugal forces, like you put sand, for example, sand, rocks, uh, heavier sand, lighter sand, whatever it might be, on a, pl on a plate and you spin it, the heavier components will drift to the outside. Okay, it, it just happens that the heavier things um, will travel further from 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 the center of the plate. And and they're saying in a similar way, <coughs> rather than forming solids, planets are formed as shells. Um, now, apparently, the hollow planet structure can explain many mysteries that have plagued us for centuries, such as unusual impact crater characteristics on terrestrial planets the mysterious red spot on Jupiter, and seismic wave data from earthquakes here on Earth. Understanding outgassing and atmosphere formation on a whole planet model helps us explain past mysteries, such as the Great Flood on Earth and the Flood on Mars. 
An expanding Earth provides the driving force behind the drifting continents, mountain building, and earthquakes, and is also accountable for changing the value of gravity over time. In the past, when the Earth was smaller, centrif centrifugal forces <coughs> from a, a much faster speed of rotation reduced the effects of gravity in equatorial regions. This reduction of gravity is what allowed the great dinosaurs and all past life to grow to much larger sizes. Well, that's actually interesting. I mean, a lot of these things make you pause and think. Um, we don't have animals of that size anymore. Why don't we have animals of that size anymore? The biggest animals you know, that approach that size live in the ocean, and that's, I guess, to support their weight. Um, and a lot of the other dinosaurs that we know about, the really massive ones, we think spend most of the time in water as well. So I don't know necessarily how true all of this is, but, but it's certainly very interesting to think about. So think about it. So the Earth expands, right? The Earth expands, gets bigger, and, and as such, the continents drift further and further apart from each other. If you were to shrink the Earth, all the continents would fit again. So it is not a matter of, of breaking apart and moving around the Earth, right? It is more a matter of the Earth getting bigger. That's, that's really the theory here, right? And it, which brings us to, I guess, to Charles Hapgood and his crustal displacement theory. Um, I want to quickly um, explain to you what that is. So Charles Hapgood, <coughs> who was a, con a contemporary of Einstein's, in fact, his theory was supported uh, uh, by Einstein at the time in 1958. Einstein wrote the foreword the, um, in the, uh, uh, for the Earth's shifting crust, which was Hapgood's 1958 book. Now, um, he believed that uh, the Earth is in fact uh, – uh, Living, we're living on a crust that is that is utterly movable, right? It is not. It, it's it's like an orange peel or an orange uh, that that comes loose from 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 the flesh, if you will, right? So then you can move it about uh, its center, and it, it was the crux of his theory. And you know, he, that's what he thought caused the massive extinction of mammoths and, and saber tooths and whatnot that he found in Siberia. It was this. So the South Pole could become the equator, and the North Pole could become the equator in, in the blink of an eye. The crust would simply shift. And he, he believed that maybe it was an ice buildup that would cause the imbalance, you know, whatever it might have been, and then the shift would cause the entire crust to move. Now, this is not so much hollow earth theory, but it certainly gives you a different view on, on, on crustal displacement theory, right? Or on, on the crustal theory that we have today, which is, of course, tectonic plates. Uh, we believe that everything moves along tectonic plates and is subject to movements from within the Earth. Uh, mountain building happens from within and, and so forth. You know, continents colliding, but the push comes from within. But not in a growth pattern, if you will, but rather in a push outwards pattern. So the Earth is not getting bigger. It is just moving around. Right. Now, <clears throat> this, is, this is where I get... And Dave, I, I need your I need you to enlist your assistance here. Um, Mm -hmm. This this is the controversial primary evidence that we have for Hollow Earth. Okay, now, <laughs> and this is Richard E. Burt, Admiral Richard E. Burt, eighteen eighty eight to nineteen fifty seven. Yes. What do we know about this gentleman, sir? <clears throat> All right. Well, to start with, um, uh, he went on a or on, on an Antarctic expedition number one, uh, between 1928 and 1930. He went on a second one, 1933 to 1935. Then a third, 1931 to 1941. And he brought back some very unusual findings. Let's put it this way. So um, he claimed to fly over the North Pole in 1926. It is claimed that so these were, they were Antarctic. So he, he, he went over the, the North Pole and decided to do this in the South Pole. But over the North Pole, he said he verbally admitted that he failed to reach it and had to, had to turn around but couldn't afford to admit it. He claimed that as he flew into darkness with gauges gone haywire, he was shocked at the terrain changes and had to turn around. In 1947, a radio broadcast, Admiral Byrd said before his pole flight from base 400 miles from the pole, I'd like to see that land before, beyond the pole. 
that the area beyond the pole is the centre of the great unknown. After flight radio commentaries were, during his Arctic flight of seven, this is the Arctic flight, of 1,700 miles beyond the pole, he reported by radio that he saw below him not ice and snow, but land areas consisting of mountains, forest, green vegetation, lakes and rivers, and in the underbrush saw a strange animal resembling a mammoth. And the air temperature outside the cockpit measured 74 degrees Fahrenheit. <coughs> oh, I couldn't hit the mute button quick enough. Pardon me, everyone. Oh, I can't do my magic anymore. You scared so, me. <laughs> so, I have to say that in 1946, having completed his three Antarctic expeditions, he was... He returned to, the, to America and declared that he'd found an opening. And not only was there an opening, but that he'd... Was it that he'd entered into it, Mekki? This is the most important expedition yes, sir. in the history of the world, mm -hmm. he says, he notes. And the American military gave him... This is Operation High Jump... Mm -hmm gave him uh, a tremendous quantity of, of vessels to go down there. And this is post-World War II. This is 1946. Mm -hmm. They gave him a whole bunch of military, some naval, and they said that he had, I think it was three months' time to go down there and investigate with a whole bunch of military. Now, I don't know why you'd need military. If you flew, flew over there and saw a hole which was what the original report said. Do, do, you, do we have, Mickey, I'm just trying to, I'm just glancing over it. I'm seeing if I can find the... The clip? Yeah. Well, we've got clips from 56, uh, which says, uh, uh, on January 13, members of the United States expedition, this is, uh, sorry, January 13, 1956, uh, mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, penetrated land uh, extent of 2,300 miles beyond the pole. The flight was made by Rear Admiral George Dufek of the United States Navy Air Unit. Another radio announcement, January 13, 1956. Members of the United States expedition accomplished a flight of 2,700 miles <coughs> from the base at McMurdo Sound, which is 400 miles west of the South Pole, and penetrated a land uh, extent of 2,300 miles beyond the pole. Okay? Uh, in a radio clip... Uh, in, uh, on March 13, 1956, Admiral Byrd said the following, The present expedition has opened up a vast new land. In 57, just before his death, he said, That enchanted continent in the sky, land of everlasting mystery. <clears throat> now, there is a newspaper article uh, that we found. In fact, we found the original. Uh, and Dave's friend helped us find it. Remember, Dave? Yeah, I do. And this is the <clears throat> translation, if you... Um, uh, of, of the article. Now, the mission, uh, as Dave said, was Operation High Jump. It's given 4,000 servicemen. And there was an interview with Admiral Byrd. And these are all quotes now I'm going to give to you guys. Now, one assumes that the uh, purpose of the expedition was to explore Antarctica. However, Admiral Byrd said that the mission was to make some geographical discoveries, and when these had been made, the expedition would return home. Quote, the expedition completed this mission in, in less than two months and left the region after having made major geographical discoveries. The admiral stated that in his opinion, the expedition had established a precedent without parallel as regard the rapidity with which ge geographical discoveries were made. Here one asks, without parallel in comparison to what? <clears throat> Was there some kind of timetable, you know, to, for this to make? As regards to the recently terminated expedition, Admiral Byrd said that the most important result of the observation discoveries made was the bearing with which these had on the security of the United States. Now you ask yourself, <laughs> an expedition in the Antarctic, South Pole, what, what, what kind of bearing could this possibly have on the security of the United States? The Admiral went on to say, I'm in a position perhaps better than any other person to realize the significance of how to use the scientific knowledge in these explorations because I can make comparisons. Twenty years ago, I made my first Antarctic uh, expedition. So he did. You know, he, he did go to the North and the South Pole. That is correct. Mm -hmm. Now, if he was making uh, comparisons between what he saw now and then, 
20 years ago. This implies that something relating to the geography of Antarctica must have changed. Yes. Otherwise, there would be no point in making a comparison, right? Because everything would be the same. This might also explain the true mission of the expedition, to investigate the top topographical change. Now, Bird was obviously referring to the Bird expedition of 1928-1930. Uh, 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 this was the expedition one which Dave referred to. Uh, in what way did these discoveries and observations adversely affect the security of the United States? I think that's a fair question. Another, another quote here. <clears throat> Admiral Richard E. Byrd warned us today of the need for the United States to adopt protective measures against the possibility of invasion of the country by hostile aircraft proceeding from the polar regions. I don't want to scare anybody, but the bitter reality is that in the event of a new war, the United States will be attacked by aircraft flying in from one or both poles. Interesting. On three occasions in the article, Admiral Byrne warned of invasion of the country. This term does not mean invasion of airspace. It means invasion of the United States by a foreign power. So we're talking about like a continental invasion. In 1947, the United States was the world's only superpower. The threat to the security of the United States was of attack and invasion by aircraft proceeding from the polar regions. One of the main reasons for Admiral Byrd's early return was to warn his countrymen to prepare defenses against this threat. He could have reported his findings by signal, but instead he decided to head for home. So urgent was what he had to say. Now, when one considers the logistics which would be involved in operating an aerial invasion force to vanquish and take over the United States, starting from the South Pole, we can see at once that the idea is nonsensical. Unless... Unless the enemy force is vastly superior in weaponry and in anti-electronic warfare. This is the reason why so many commentators have seen the presence of an alien force stationed presumably in other dimension in Antarctica. Now, this is where it gets tinfoil heady, guys, right? This is the bit I love the most. So, what did Admiral Byrd see in Antarctica, which led him to believe that an imminent threat of attack against the United States existed? What were the geographical changes to Antarctica, which he had seen by comparison? If he was mentally ill, he would have been replaced, surely, right? But it does appear that he enjoyed the full support of his commanders and his decisions. So this is, okay, this is now where I'm opening up the floor for speculation. Is it possible? Now, we, we know that the Nazis may have had bases there. We know the Nazis were looking for all kinds of ancient technology. Is it possible that alien bases, inner, inner Earth bases... Maybe there is, like these vast cavern systems we talked about, maybe there is an entrance at the South Pole in Antarctica. It makes sense. You know, it's a landmass. Is it possible that these, these, these vast war machines were preserved in some way? And maybe did, without even you know, bothering about the Nazis too much, but is it possible that maybe some of the ancients survived? Did, did the visitors, are aliens involved here? Or, or are the aliens all along people that have been with us you know, for, for all this time? Maybe that's where they just lived. Maybe that's... Exactly. Maybe the Earth changed so much and they used to be in a nice climate. Maybe they decided that was the best thing for them. Maybe they decided that, you know, since we couldn't get down there anyway, what was the point in hiding their location yeah. too much? Yeah. Oops, they've got flight now. Yeah. And if you look at the status of Antarctica today, the, the continent of Antarctica is not owned by anyone. Every nation that sort of borders it wants to own a slice. And there are some permanent stations there, yes, but not a lot. And, and I mean, the, 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 the continent itself is probably the size of Australia. So it's not small. And, and who knows what we haven't discovered yet. It was stated that he saw a large cavern. It's even stated in one report that he'd flown into it. Correct, sir. He, yep. He, and in fact, I have, uh, it's, it's a lithograph that was self-published, I'm sure, um, which, which I have amongst my books here which describes his, uh, his expedition in detail. And he said he kept flying and flying, and after a while the land turned green. And he saw animals, and the outside temperature rose. We're talking the, the, the South Pole here, guys. So, um, and that's very strange. Now, if there were truly an opening in the South or North Pole, for that matter, which is 4,000 kilometers across, you'd ask yourself, well, how come we haven't seen it? Well, for the most part, the, the poles are covered constantly by clouds, for the most part. Right, and secondly, well, you don't control the technology that flies over the pole, does it? Do you? Like, you don't actually have something that flies across the pole and takes pictures. No, you don't. Those are satellites, and they're usually owned by governments or the military. So, 
if in fact there were a hole there, okay, and a vast hole like that, you probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference, you know, as far as the horizon is concerned. I mean, you would be sailing and sailing and sailing. You might not be able to to tell that you're sailing down into a hole if it's that vast. Do, do you know it's it's all white? Have a look at it on Google Maps, and most of it's photoshopped white over white. Yeah, right. So it's and in fact, any map that you see these days, it's it's spread out. You don't have a global representation or like a spherical representation of the world map. You have a representation that's like it's called a Mercator projection, right? So it's a flat, it's mm-hmm. a flat surface of the Earth, and and at the bottom you have the Antarctic, but it's all sort of you know un, un, unravelled, if if you will, at the bottom, and then the topic of the North Pole, which is also unravelled, so which gives you the continents we're interested in, obviously for the most part, you know, Africa, Asia, blah blah, blah all that. <clears throat> uh, but but nobody bothers with too much detail on the North and South Pole because you know by the fall there's not much there. We're told. Is that true? you can't you can't even see the bases, the U.S. bases no. and the English base, the Australian base, and and all of those others. But um, I have to just before we wind up because we've got uh, about you know three four minutes to go. Nazi subs during you said to avoid the Nazis. Yeah, no, no, no. Add. Just go ahead. <laughs> yeah, but but, ju- but during the description of it, um, the Nazi subs were have been reported now by people living in South America to have actually refueled. And re, um, and you know, got food and supplies and stuff on board, and and as they went down the South American coast near to the end of World War Two, towards the Antarctic, and um, it's also presumed. I mean, the, we talked about this with the Simpsons um, <laughs> gag gag on that Hitler's in South America, you know, uh, because that's where it stems from. Was this story, and. If they were truly going down there, why didn't and and you know he had fifty six u s ships with him in his expedition as Admiral Byrd, why did they hightail it out of there? He claims that he was going back to warn everyone, oh my goodness, you know, watch out, there's stuff down there that could take us, but that's they they what was what he omitted from his statement, which has been followed up by the military statements on this, was that they suffered horrendous losses. Mm -hmm. Horrendous losses. And this wasn't due to frostbite or anything, because they could just go beneath deck and they were pretty, they were okay. It was that they they had, in fact, encountered an unusually technological superior foe who told them to go away. Now, whether or not that was they befriended by the Nazis who had gone down there, like the remnants of the the war, um, whether whether or not that's true or not, I don't know. But we we know coming from the South Pole, out of the water, and um, presumably from an open hole, um, <laughs> right? Yeah. Because it, it's presumed, unless we've Mackie and I've been down there, we're going to say it's presumed. Um, fund us to go down there as an expedition. Um, there was a uh, a large tsunami effect mm-hmm. from a large invasion force which had flown up the South American coastline and darted inland over Mexico once um, the fighter jets were scrambled. And this occurred, I don't know, about 10 years ago, I think it was. Uh, someone correct me in the chat room. It's, it's so plausible... It's actually plaus- more plausible now because of what Stan Deo said mm-hmm. about there being a deep underground military bases down there now mm-hmm. as well. So who knows? If you, if you can build an underground base, maybe that gives you an alliance with them automatically. See, I was going to – this is something we should have asked. The next time we have guests on that, that are au fait with this subject, we should ask them if, if in fact these bases were built recently or if they're just taken over by, I don't know, the U.S., the Soviet Union, mm. whoever, right? I, I want to know if they're just moving in to existing bases. Because that's what Roy Snyder says. Roy Snyder mm. said that he killed a few. They'd happened into one when they were drilling to make a base. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I don't know. The, the, we know that we're currently building underground bases. If If we had all but disappeared due to a, thanks to Thomas, a... GRB, a gamma ray burst, <laughs> and a subsequent civilization of humans who don't have any connection to us in any memory, if they found them, would they think we inhabited the underworld? Yes. Next week, Men in Black. 
I can't wait for that show. It's going to be interesting. Thanks, Mickey. <laughs> See you later, guys. <laughs>